Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and in this video, I'm going to continue the discussion on um, Jose Ortega y Gasset's The Revolt of the Masses. Um, what I've been doing the past few videos is doing um, an analysis, not a book review, of the chapters, and currently this discussion is on chapter 4, which is uh, entitled The Increase of Life. The Increase of Life. And again, this is uh, Jose Ortega y Gasset's the Revolt of the Masses. Uh, it's an exceptional book. I've been uh, fascinated by the book for um, a number of years now, uh, 10, 11 years. I first got introduced to the book in uh, 1999, 2000, and um, I read it uh, many times, and I decided that I wanted to do an analysis of uh, Gasset, a very detailed analysis of his, his, uh, his findings. So tonight continues that discussion. I have my, uh, my notes with me, and uh, let's begin, uh, chapter 4. Alright, um, the thing that he does in this chapter, The Increase of Life, is to talk about what that means. Right? What, does it talk, what does it mean to talk about the, the increase of life? Right? Um, what does he mean by that? And then also, um, in relationship to all of the other discussions that we've had in chapter 1, 2, and 3, um, he introduces the idea of two ideas. One idea of uh, average existence, and we know now what average existence is. It's the existence of the masses. Um, we know that the masses um, are subordinate to the aristocracy, but are superior to the minority. So we know that. The next thing that we understand, I think in chapter 3, he talked about, or chapter 2, he talked about what was known as the plentitude of the time, right? And we said that the plentitude of the time. Um, there's two ways of interpreting um, our relationship, our time, to historical time. The, the first interpretation is to say that um, this, there was a golden age, and we talked about what the golden age looked like. And what happens is that the average existence of each epoch is progressively deteriorating, right? It's diminishing, so that our age is more vile than the age prior to it our age and so on. So that there was some age in the distant past that was a golden age. It was better, it had more meaning, it had more significance than our age. And this idea is a pessimistic, reflective look backward on history and the ideas that were used were nostalgia and obviously the concept of the golden age. The antithesis to the idea of the golden age is that of the modern age, right? And specifically modernity. And the question is then, what is the concept of modernity and how does this evolve out uh, from Gasset's discussion? And what Gasset says is the idea of modernity is just the opposite. Instead of um, diminishing with the progress of time, with the progress of time it increases, right? So that we are now at a point in time where the average existence is substantially better than the average existence of some other time. And this time is the realization, the satisfaction of desires and dreams that forefathers and those prior to us, our predecessors, had. Um, and that this time in, in, uh, in, in existence, our time in existence under the interpretation of modernity, is a plentitude. Uh, and that's basically where we ended. Um, what we're going to do today in uh, chapter 4 is we're going to see how he takes this concept of plenitude and he weaves it with this notion of the increase in life. So uh, let's, let's see where we are now that, now that I've uh, recapped the last three chapters. Um, Gasset says in chapter 4 that life has become worldwide. And I want to read, um, read a few sections for you. Um, he, says, he says the following. And I think this is, uh, this is important. This fact is almost grotesque and incredible in its stark and simple truth. It is just this, that the world has suddenly grown larger, and with it, and in it, life itself. To start with, life has become, in actual fact, worldwide in character. Life has become worldwide in character. I mean that the content of existence for the average man of today includes the whole planet, that each individual habitually lives the life of the whole world. What does that mean? Well, life has become worldwide. I think this is amazing that Gasset uh, has, has stumbled upon this concept 
uh, and this this was published in uh, in Spanish uh, in 1930. Right in 1930, this was published. Um, so he was working and formulating these ideas in the 20s. So it's amazing that he thought in that era of a worldwide existence. And obviously, um, what we're discussing uh, has direct implication or applications rather to the World Wide Web. Right. Um, the age of the internet, the dawn of global communication, global interaction. I am now doing a video lecture at a particular point in time. I will go home, I will have this video edited, I will upload this video. At some other point in time, I will share it with you on YouTube. You will be watching this video at some time in the future. Uh, at that time in the future, um, you can be anywhere, right? I am here locally in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but I have people that I communicate with in uh, Australia. I have people that I talk to in Nigeria. I have people that I talk with in uh, Croatia, Yugoslavia, um, so that we have become global. Um, for him to be able to perceive this globalization, and not globalization in f as far as the economic globalization, but this worldwide um, almost uniformity of culture, or the, uh, the attempt to consolidate worldwide culture um, in Gazette is, I think, astounding. It's, it's, it's light years ahead of his actual time. Um, so that's the, that's the first point. Um, how does this relate to the individual is the question, right? We understand that the individual, um, as he says, he says, um, to start with, life has become an actual fact worldwide in character. Life has become worldwide. My life has become worldwide. Your life has become worldwide. How is that true in a contemporary sense? As I said, my life right now is spent um, on a global scale, on a global stage. I understand that insofar as I'm doing this, my audience now is global, and the potential for it to become global is, is almost immediate. He says, this nearness of the far off, the nearness, you see the, the, the paradox of this, the nearness of the far off. Someone right now is watching this video in, um, in Europe, right? Um, and look how close we are. Look at this bond that we're sharing. The nearness of the far off. This presence of the absence, the presence, the fact that I am um, conveying information, you are watching, consuming information, uh, and that thing that is being consumed is absence, right? The information itself isn't something that's tangible. It's not something that can be weighed or measured. It's not something that's quantifiable, but it is, right? It exists, this presence of that absence, has extended uh, in fabulous proportions the horizon of each individual's existence, right? So that now my existence, your existence, our existence, we have this shared horizon. Um, and many philosophers um, talk about this notion of a horizon. Um, I'm not going to get into that discussion now, but it's important to understand what Gisette is attempting to do, right? The, the title of the chapter is called The Increase in Life. We immediately then recognize that where there are technological advances within society. As average existence increases, as we arrive, if you subscribe to the concept of modernity, then you subscribe to the notion of the plentitude of life, right? So that we are now actualizing uh, dreams of our past. Uh, yesterday, just yesterday, um, uh, Barack Obama, President Obama signed uh, with 219 votes, the healthcare reform, right? This is huge. It's epic. Um, that is one of the examples that suffices to show um, sort of the role that modernity has. There, that dream was a dream of our predecessors. It was something that was not realized. And I've, I've done this in another lecture, the lecture right before this on chapter three. Um, and now we have, right? Um, well, what we have done now is we've looked and we've been able to see, one, the scale that our actions have. Our actions are, in this contemporary society, immediately global. This act that I'm doing, speaking to this camera, is immediately, almost immediately, global. The act is itself global, which then makes some part of my character global. And that's what he's saying. I'm able to embrace this paradox that I am both here and I'm global, that I am far-reaching and that it's near, that there is the presence of an absence, and I described it. Philosophy sometimes can get very, very heady, 
But I mean, this is this is what we do as philosophers, right? This is the stuff that I love.